Hello everyone and welcome back to Psyched. Today we are going to discuss one of the most influential psychologists of all time, our good old friend Sigmund Freud. Freud introduced a whole new way of thinking about behavior and mental health, and his contributions to the field of psychology changed the field as a whole. Now in today's video we will take a look at some of Freud's most influential theories, and we will discuss how they hold up to modern scrutiny. The first theoretical contribution made by Freud that we will discuss in this video is perhaps one of the biggest contributions that he made to the entire field, namely psychoanalysis. Prior to the development of Freud's psychoanalysis, talking therapy in response to various mental health conditions was not really something that was done. Freud developed this method after seeing his mentor Joseph Breuer working with a patient who went under the pseudonym Anna O in the early 1880s. Anna O, or Bertha Pappenheim, which was her real name, was a young woman in her early 20s who spent her days taking care of her terminally ill father. She had initially thought help from Breuer after suffering from a persistent and severe cough. Early on in the treatment, Pappenheim developed additional symptoms such as headaches, vision problems, speech problems, emotional disturbances, as well as muscle weakness and hallucinations. While her symptoms improved slightly after about a year, her symptoms returned when her father died in 1881. After failing to find a physical explanation of her symptoms, Breuer diagnosed Pappenheim with hysteria, which was a condition that a lot of women were diagnosed with at that time, evolving exaggerated emotional responses. This was initially thought to be caused by abnormalities of the nervous system and was diagnosed only in women. Nowadays, however, hysteria is completely rejected as a physical or psychological condition, and the symptoms Pappenheim was experiencing could be explained by other conditions, such as epilepsy, conversion disorder, dissociative disorder, or something else. In treating her symptoms, Breuer found that talking with Pappenheim and allowing her to speak freely using free association, they were able to trace some of her symptoms back to the point when they first appeared, which typically was during distressing events. They discovered that when Pappenheim could recall the original disturbing memory and how she felt at that time, the symptoms would be alleviated or even outright disappear. Breuer noted that what the various symptoms had in common was that they could be traced back to a traumatic event in which Pappenheim felt the need to suppress her strong emotions, rather than expressing them. While Freud himself never actually met Pappenheim, he was fascinated by this case study. As a result, he developed his own talking therapy, in which patients were encouraged to speak freely without inhibitions. Using his method, which Freud referred to as psychoanalysis, the patient was encouraged to freely talk about whatever ideas or memories that came to them, in an attempt to identify the psychological roots of their emotional suffering by the use of self-reflection and self-examination. Freud's psychoanalysis continued to spread across Europe and North America, and it evolved as more practitioners started to use and expand it. However, while Freud's psychoanalytical approach to treat psychological problems indeed was revolutionary, its popularity in today's age has been observed by other approaches to therapy, such as cognitive behavioral therapy. One reason for this shift from psychoanalysis is the heavy criticism it received. Some critics, for instance, argue that the traditional psychoanalysis is an intensive form of therapy that requires significant investment of time and money. Because of the heavy focus on free association during the therapy sessions, traditional psychoanalysis may take a very long time to identify and target underlying factors behind the symptoms. Alternative and more structured therapies may therefore be preferred for patients with immediate needs and or patients with limited financial ability. Furthermore, while Freud's psychoanalysis method did evolve over time, there has been some debate among scientists and practitioners concerning its efficacy. While some suggest that psychoanalysis may not be as effective as other, more modern forms of therapy, others argue the opposite and claiming that it is indeed more effective than other methods. Another contribution that Freud made to psychology were his various theories on what the human mind or psyche consisted of. Freud initially proposed a topographical model consisting of three parts. To illustrate this model, Freud used the analogy of an iceberg. The first level of the human psyche is consciousness. This can be found at the tip of the iceberg and refers to the continuous flow of thoughts and feelings that are in our attention at any given point. The second level is pre-consciousness or subconsciousness and is found in the iceberg right below the surface of the water. This level refers to everything in our mind that we are not aware of at the given moment, but that we could be made aware of quite easily. This is for instance the case when it comes to the information that we have stored in our memory. 
The third and final level is unconsciousness. Freud argued that just like with an iceberg, where most of it is beneath the surface, most mental processes are hidden and can't be seen. Freud emphasized the importance of the unconsciousness by arguing that it is responsible for most of our behavior. He believed that the unconscious mind governs our behavior to a greater extent than we think, and this concept of the unconscious is central in Freud's psychoanalytical theories. Later, Freud developed a more structural model of the psyche, where he argued that it consists of three parts, the it, the ego, and the superego. The it refers to the most primitive part of our psyche, and is the source of our impulsive urges. The it, which is entirely unconscious, strives for immediate gratification of the desires, wants and needs that we may have at a given moment. Examples include hunger and thirst. At the other side of the spectrum we have the superego, which is part of the psyche that internalizes the morals and standards we acquire both from our immediate family but also from society in general. The superego, which can be found at the conscious and pre-conscious levels of our psyche, is concerned with trying to achieve perfect behavior by suppressing any socially unacceptable and inappropriate behaviors. Lastly, the ego is somewhere between the id and the superego, trying to balance the needs of both id and superego. The ego, which can also be found at all levels of consciousness, tries to establish this balancing by trying to satisfy the urges of the id in ways that are safe and socially acceptable given the real-life situation the person is in. While Freud's ideas of the conscious and unconscious mind were quite influential on the field of psychology as a general, his ideas have by today's standards not held up very strongly. One reason is the lack of falsifiability of these ideas. Introduced by philosopher Karl Popper, one of the fundamental tenets of modern science is the idea of falsifiability, which is the notion that it needs to be possible for a hypothesis to be proven false. Importantly, falsifiability does not necessarily mean that a hypothesis is false, but rather that it is inherently disprovable, i.e. that I could conduct an experiment showing the opposite of the hypothesis. Freud's ideas on the human psyche are not well defined and therefore fail to meet these standards. Instead, modern science views our mind as consisting of both conscious and unconscious mental processes that are operating in tandem. While we are conscious of some of the mental processes that are taking place at a given point, there is a significant amount of important affective, motivational and even behavioral phenomena that operate outside of our awareness. These unconscious events can be triggered by external stimuli, such as people, by reflexively activating internal mental representations and processes. The last theoretical contribution of Freud that we will discuss in this video is his ideas on dreams and their significance. Freud was known to describe dreams as the royal road to the unconscious and argued that by analyzing them we can take a peek into the unconscious mind. Because of this, dream interpretation was an important part of Freud's psychoanalytical therapy. According to Freud, throughout our day the id produces unconscious desires and impulses that the superego wants to repress. These repressed urges or wishes are then manifested in dreams and typically take the form of these wishes being fulfilled. Freud believed that the content of our dreams that we remember when we wake up consists of repressed wishes and impulses that were disguised in symbolism. By disguising these repressed impulses in symbolic meaning, we are able to transform them into less threatening and less socially unacceptable forms, which allows us to reduce our ego's anxiety. Now, in modern research, the way scientists understand dreaming is quite a bit different. In response to Freud's theory on dreams, Hobson and McCarley introduced an activation synthesis hypothesis of dreaming in the 1970s, where they proposed that dreams, rather than reflecting any form of actual meaning worth deciphering, originate from neural signals generated in the brainstem during REM sleep. According to the model, a dream is experienced when the high-level cortical areas, which are less active during sleep, try to make sense of the chaotic input it receives from the brainstem. This model has since been updated, as scientific advances have been made in neuroimaging. Scientists today view dreaming as a complex event influenced by several different factors, such as the nature of neural activation during sleep, the source of sensory information from the internal and external world, and the presence of specific neurochemicals. Research has also suggested that dreams reflect the replaying of recent day-to-day -day events, which help us process this information during memory consolidation. In conclusion, while some of the theories and models put forth by Freud may not hold up to modern scrutiny, there is no doubt that his contributions have been incredibly influential. A lot of the modern theories and scientific advancements made in the field of psychology today still build on the foundations of Freud's theories. 
Now, that's it. If you enjoyed this video, consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel. Don't forget to hit the notification bell and we hope to see you in the next video.